I will just wait a couple of minutes to let the attendees come in. All right, I just want to welcome everybody as we get started today. Not known for being on time in the virtual world, um, but I do appreciate things are recorded when you miss the openings, uh, but we'll do try to give another minute or so as folks get um, acclimated into our Zoom today. We're expecting somewhere over 200 today, but many know as you register, you don't always attend, especially when you know you get the recordings after. But I'll get started today just for the sake of really maximizing our time today for Q&A with our panelists. We have a really robust um, group of panelists today, and really that's our goal is really for you to get to know them and get comfortable with asking them questions and really learning how to navigate um, NIFA, particularly around this topical area of local and regional food systems, which we have a lot to offer. My name is Sheila Fleischiger, and I have the privilege of helping lead our NIFA nutrition security team, which I'll talk about later um, today, which is a group of more than 80 of us here at NIFA. And I've had um, the pleasure of really working with uh, a talented webinar team, many of them uh, behind the scenes today, Danielle Farley, Cassandra Hughes, Stephanie Morris, Amber Gellick, and many more who really make this happen, including our communications team, particularly Matt Browning um, for this one. Um, this is our 16th edition of the NIFA Nutrition Security Webinar Series. We've received a lot of feedback, uh, positive feedback, um, just to be able to, to get to know what we're doing around this evolving concept and really get to know a lot of our new staff as we really um, work on rebuilding at this agency. I will say be patient. Our webinar page is still being rebuilt um, as we add all 16 editions and now future future um, editions as well. Um, so please feel free to keep um, looking back at the webinar series. If there's anyone that you need in the immediate where it's not live, um, just let me know. We're happy to send you that edition. Before we get started today, I do want to call attention to our efforts to increase equity, inclusion, um, diversity, and accessibility. And that includes our ability to make these um, webinars closed caption and a variety of other efforts that we're doing behind the scenes to really make our materials more accessible. So please let us know if um, you need any of those services, we're happy to help um, oblige in future editions or as we can today. Please just put it in the chat. I wanna go through a couple housekeeping items. Um, please use the question and answer function, not the chat box to submit questions. Um, I think they've changed the settings on the Zoom. We were, we were debating earlier on whether or not you guys could chat with us. Um, if not, please put it in the Q&A. We do love questions, comments, and any key information that you need. And we do encourage you if you um, need a follow-up response to please include your name and email, just in case we don't get to your question today or your question requires a more elaborate response and we need to be able to contact you. So feel free to provide your contact information if it's helpful today. As I indicated, we have a robust list of panelists today. They're gonna each individually introduce themselves and also take questions at the end of today. So feel free to um, put your questions in as you hear them, uh, but just know that we'll have all the presentations go first and then we'll do Q&A. And as I indicated, we do have a webinar series page where we put our web page. And then particularly for this webinar, um, once the recording's ready, hopefully in the next week or two, as we make everything ADA accessible, we'll also be launching a local and regional food system topic page. It's going to have all the programs, many of which we'll touch on today, um, and many more um, links to that. It really links to the key program folks that need to contact as you have questions to explore those opportunities or want to learn more about those program impacts. I do want to highlight we do hope to have some really fun uh, fall editions coming your way. We'll have a tribal food sovereignty webinar series. We're also working to finalize the date on a promoting youth voice webinar that's really going to highlight some of our work with our 4 Hers. And then we're also working with our USDA Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion on a joint webinar um, regarding our efforts here at NIFA to help make MyPlate a household name. So really excited about these uh, upcoming editions and really do again want to emphasize um, as we've been coming under new le leadership of Dr. Mesereau, we are really trying to work across a variety of our systems to do better here. 
and that's across our workforce, our processes, RFAs, and reporting systems. And today, I really do want to emphasize that workforce piece because I think, again, you'll see a lot of faces today, in particular, our efforts to really help build that pipeline. So again, really hope to introduce you to many of them and really encourage you to reach out to them as you get to build relationships here with NIFA. I do want to highlight again our NIFA nutrition security team that I indicated I have the, the, really the privilege to help lead. This team um, started in the early stages of the new administration and has grown to more than 80 members. It's just made up of such talented staff um, really across all institutes and uh, offices here at NIFA. And really in less than two years, we've done amazing things to really help the secretary prioritize um, tackling food and nutrition insecurity. Last year, this team won the NIFA Team Award and also the USDA Research Education and Economics Mission Area. And this year, a sub-team of our NIFA Nutrition Security Team, the Gustav Team, which you'll hear from today, um, won the Team Award. So we're really excited for the work that we have underway um, with this team. And really do want to kind of emphasize my favorite motto, which is teamwork makes the dream work. And even on days like today, when, when you're making webinar series, there's so many um, hands that go into the work that we do. I do want to emphasize that um, our efforts around nutrition security, it is an evolving concept, and we've tried our best to, to highlight our relevant work on the USDA Food and Nutrition Security website and also our NIFA Food and Nutrition Security topic page. Feel free to reach out to us if there's things missing or questions that you have, but really you'll hopefully see that we've got more than 2 million um, annually that we're investing to make this work, and really that's only across five programs. And we really have brought together more than 20 programs that additionally have equities and helping us tackle food and nutrition security. And again, that's where that team of 80 really comes when you're kind of pulling together 20 of NIFA's 70 programs. I want to highlight, um, as we celebrated last week, the first anniversary of the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health, that NIFA has really been instrumental in developing this conference and now implementing the national strategy. We'll soon have a blog from our Associate Director of Programs, Dr. Dion Tu, highlighting our work to date, including an exciting announcement last week, um, including an exciting announcement last week, um, launching the Ascend Nutrition Hub. So we'll learn more about that through the blog and, and through future webinar series. I also want to highlight that a lot of our cross-priority team approaches um, are really highlighted today. And I think that's a big piece for us at NIFA with the nutrition security team is that the secretary has five priority areas. And we really try to work across each of those priorities with intersections with climate, new and better markets, with um, building the pipeline, with diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility in mind, and really, again, um, helping with promoting youth voice throughout all these efforts. So today we're gonna to highlight a lot, I think through the local and regional food systems where you'll see each of these priorities at play, but you'll also see the intersections between all of them. And we are just learning, right? So if there's ideas or um, suggestions you have, feel free to reach out to us. We very much want to do better with the interdisciplinary work that's really gonna help elevate all these priorities together. I did wanna emphasize, at least from a local or regional food systems perspective, the secretary also has been working on a broad food systems transformation initiative, and NIF has been lucky to be at the table for that. I won't, for um, the sake of today, go through kind of our broad rationale for why we invest in local and regional food systems, but really do want to emphasize that um, NIF brings a variety of equities to the table to support food system transformation. We'll highlight a number of those programs today, but we're happy to discuss others as you have them today or in future editions. I want to take a minute here to just kind of walk through, as I mentioned, that big number, 70 programs that NIFA has. And we also have various types of programs, as many of you guys might know as folks who are funded by us and or who have sought funding. And we have competitive programs, we have capacity programs, we have non-competitive awards. And all these add up collectively to about $2 billion. For local and regional food systems, and we use um, this abbreviation a number of times in this presentation, LRFS. We've categorized our relevant programs through our AFRI programs, that's our Agriculture, Food, and Research Initiative, and then also our non-AFRI programs. And so today I'm going to just kind of highlight uh, the variety of AFRI programs that we have available, and we'll have a couple highlighted by the program leads today, but not all of them. And so again, if you have questions about them, often those program leads 
can answer them. If not, we'll make sure you get connected to the right program needs. And as I mentioned, when we release today's reporting, we're going to release a topic page that's going to have links to all of these relevant programs and get you directly to the program staff. So again, these are all the relevant um, AFRI programs. This is our Agriculture Food Research Initiative, all the various priorities that could support work that really advances local and regional food systems. And then we have another whole list um, relating to our non-AFRI programs. And so you can see this is a range of programs from our 4-H program to our GUSNIP program that's gonna be highlighted today, oh, to a variety of other programs that we're gonna talk about that um, relate to our um, support of minority serving institutions. So we're really excited about the large portfolio of AFRI and non-AFRI programs that we have that can support local and regional food systems. But again, we're very excited for the panelists that are here today to highlight their relevant work. And again, we're, there's a program not covered today. Most of the time, we probably could answer the question for you. If not, we'll make sure we get you to the right program lead. So I want to take the time now to, to introduce our first panelist. This is a, a fun panelist for me. This is a prior graduate, graduate school roommate um, at Penn State, Dr. Rachel Melnick. Um, Dr. Melnick comes, with, uh, comes to us with years of experience at NIFA and now is our division director for global climate change. I think I got that right. Um, and Rachel is going to um, walk through two programs from her division um, in lieu of her um, staff member who is not able to join us today. Rachel, I'm going to hand it off to you. Yes, and I have dropped for the, especially for this first slice contact information for Dr. Amy Ganguly as well as the AFRI SAS team page. So if you have additional questions that we cannot answer on this webinar or some follow up, please reach out to them. So we're going to start out by talking about the Sustainable Agricultural Systems Program, which is one of the three requests for applications under AFRI or the Agricultural Food Research Initiative Program. The SAS program funds system level projects that use transdisciplinary approaches and the projects are fully integrated, meaning that the project should have research and extension and education approaches to address the challenges that the project would like to address. The program operates on an annual cycle. So the RFA opens every year to get letters of intent and then proposals and has an award side of up to $10 million for each individual project. So these are very large scale projects. The goal of this program is to promote the sustainable supply of abundant, affordable, safe, nutritious, and accessible foods and other agricultural products while enhancing economic opportunities and improving long-term health and well-being. Within this program, there is a goal area addressing food and nutrition security that has a specific emphasis on local and regional food systems. If you want more information, go ahead and click on that QR code and it'll open right up to the page that address all the information you might want. This goal on nutrition and food security emphasizes local and regional food systems, including applications with strategies to develop shorter food supply chains for nutritious foods that are equitable, culturally appropriate, and compatible with community needs. So if you're interested to see what previously funded projects we have in this place, go ahead and click on the QR code and we you can see all the projects that are funded and specifically projects that are addressing local and regional foods. There is one of an example um, on food system resiliency for children's health living, which is a developing a systems model to identify and test drivers of resiliency in food supply change chains that is increasing food and nutrition security, healthful dietary patterns, and healthy body size among children across U.S. affiliated Pacific insular areas as just one example, but there are definitely other examples that you can look at. So with that, I will go ahead and ask for the next slide, please. So our other program area that is relevant but very different is our program on Extension Education and U.S. Climate Hub Partnership, which is in the AFRI Foundational RFA, and it is program area priority or A1721. So this program supports work at the intersection of climate change and food and nutrition security. So this is actually working to help develop and expand the capacities and partner with the USDA regional climate hubs. So this program funds projects that provide effective 
translatable, and scalable approaches to address climate change through regional partnerships, including the USDA climate hubs and extension, as well as others doing outreach in this space in fiscal year 2022, the American um, Farm Trust was one of the people who are working in this space who got a grant. So projects are working to address nutrition sensitive climate smart production practices that increase returns on investment for farmers and producers and mitigate economic cost of food waste and particularly among focusing on doing outreach for underserved farmers are really a great fit to this program. So I do wanna note that this is unique in that the projects submitted to this program area are for up to $1 million and they should be extension only or integrated that must have an extension component, meaning research and extension or extension and education. And they should be regional in scope. For those of you not familiar, the USDA Climate Hubs, you can see the webpage there and visit them, is a regional-based initiative. This is a partnership between Ag Research Service, the Forest Service, and National Resource Conservation Service to provide outreach efforts to land managers across the United States. Um, they are now reaching their 10-year anniversary coming up in February. So this initiative has really grown from a small initiative that has now has great partnerships and even is doing webinars and outreach with FEMA. So if you want additional information and information to connect to the Climate Hubs, visit that webpage there. If you're interested in applying to this program, we really suggest that you reach out to a regional climate hub either in your area or in one of the other areas that you might work in to see if they'd be interested in partnering on the proposal so that the proposal you would put in not only meets the needs of the RFA, but also meets the needs of a USDA climate hub partner. Um, they're really great to work with, so you can just go ahead and contact them and email either the director of the hub or the hub coordinator. So that is what we have, and up next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Charlotte Tuttle to talk about some of the programs in her area. Hi, thank you. So my name is Charlotte Tuttle, and I am a national program leader in the Division of Ag Systems. Uh, where I manage the agricultural economics programs, which include five programs. Now, the programs I'm going to talk to today, one is a cross-cutting program, and one is a program within um, agricultural economics. So this first program is new. It's called the Center for Research, Behavioral Economics, and Extension on Food Loss and Waste. So um, the purpose of this program is to fund research and extension projects that look at the costs and benefits of policy and behavioral interventions related to food loss and waste. And we're looking at this from farm to consumer. Um, another part of this is to develop economic models related to food loss and waste and to advance the science needed to make food systems less, less wasteful. So the application deadline for this program has passed um, and um, we are unclear about uh, where it will go in the future, but um, the purpose is to fund one center in order to explore this research. Um, next slide, please. So um, the other program I wanted to highlight was the Economics, Markets, and Trade program. This program, um, how I describe it, is it's the General Agricultural Economics program. Most ag econ research fits well within this program. So the purpose of this program is to consider a number, number of ag econ questions, including agricultural market structure, competitiveness and in international trade, production and resource use, and also consumer behavior, as well as um, nutrition and food security, and farm labor and policy, and ag policy design and impact. So historically, economics, markets, and trade has um, allocated funding toward research related to food loss and waste. Um, and I think this is the end of my slides. We are going to turn it over to Dr. Sarah Rucker. Thanks so much, Charlotte, and good morning, everybody. So I'm gonna talk about another unique program that we fund at NIFA, 
And this program is called the Regional Rural Development Centers. This program is unique in its relation to local and regional food systems because A, it's one of the titles of the program that actually has food not at all in the title itself. So at first glance, if you're looking through our um, grant opportunities, you might not know that local and regional food systems is nested within a topic like this. All more to the point of why we do webinars such as the one that we're doing today, and also why we want to have a one-stop shop for a local regional food systems topical page for NIFA so that you can find programs like this in the future. The other unique thing about this program is that it's what we call a directed RFA, which means that it's not an open competition. Um, to the general public. It's actually directed to applicants who are selected host institutions um, that are selected by their regions. And so in this particular program, each of the four USDA regions hosts a regional competition for one university to take the lead, in this case on rural development research and technical assistance. And their job also, in addition to conducting research, is to coordinate all the land grant universities within their specific region to have cross uh, sort of state line and really um, regional sort of level, regional level analysis on rural development topics. So that's a little bit about the setup of how this program works. The next slide, if you could advance that, is an example of how at this regional level, um, different food systems research and technical assistance is taking place under this program. So I recognize the text is a bit small here, but what you'll see is one of our four centers, this is the Northeast, their webpage shows that they are conducting all different kinds of research, food systems being one of their sort of many topics that they touch. And you can see through these different hyperlinks, links to past research that they've done, links to data, links to technical assistance, um, webinars, and also publications that they've put out. And why a program like this could be useful to you all, especially in the general public, looking to do um, research or expand your own reach of the applied work that you're doing in local regional food systems, is that these RRDCs are actually data warehouses for you. So you can reach out to them and you can search their websites for existing uh, primary and secondary data sources to help support your own projects. You can also reach out to the leadership to ask to help them connect you to other regional um, folks who are doing the work. So again, they sort of play operator in that way to help you meet other researchers and extension faculty and staff who are doing the actual applied work of local and regional food systems. And then the third way that you can reach out to a group like this is that they do have um, sub-award programs. So if you are in one of these regions, you can reach out and ask about what their current status is for the sub-awards. They re-grant money from NIFA to fund very regional, local-specific topics on local and regional food systems being one of them. So again, this is kind of a unique program in the sort of suite of programs that you're going to hear about today from the rest of my colleagues. But we wanted to let you know that there are different ways that NIFA sort of touches this topic at multiple levels. And it's not always just sort of an open call about food systems from our regular um, open competition. But also, you know, we wanted to connect you to our partners who are doing local regional food systems research and technical assistance at multiple levels. To that end, I'll drop in a link to find your RRDC in your region. There are four of them, and this is the main site here with the map. And please don't hesitate to reach out if you'd like for further connection. With that, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Jean-Melise, on community food projects. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jamili Socasio, and I'm the pro I'm a program specialist. I'm a program specialist at the Institute of Food Safety and Nutrition. The Community Food Projects or CFP Competitive Grants Program is intended to bring together the stakeholders from distinct parts. Sorry from distinct parts of the food system and to foster understanding of our nation, national food security strengths and how they might improve local food systems. Dr. Lydia Kame is the national program leader for this program and her information is at the top of this slide. The goals for this program are to find 
food insecurity through developing and or implementing community food projects that help promote the self-sufficient of low-income communities. To increase food security in community, to bring the whole food system together to access strength and establish linkage. To create sustainable food system that improve the self-reliance of community members over the food needs to meet the food needs of individuals living under the federal poverty line through food distribution, outreach to increase participation in federally assisted nutritional programs, or to improve access to food, to promote comprehensive responses to local food access, farm and nutrition issues, to create community-led state, local or neighborhood food and agricultural programs, to include equipment necessary for the efficient operation of a project and to provide it innovative marketing activities mutually benefit agricultural producers and low income consumers. Um, for there is this request of application, we have three types of grants. First is the planning grant, which has a maximum of 35 thousand dollars over three years with a hundred percent match. Uh, the second is the community food project grant with a maximum of four hundred thousand dollars over four years also with a hundred percent match. And finally the training and technical assistance continuation award with a funding of two hundred thousand uh, dollars two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year that will be up to 1 million for four years and 0% match. This request for application for this program, the CFP, is currently open until October 30. Please feel free to reach out to us for any assistance. Now I will pass it to Dr. Mallory Kenis. Thank you very much, Jim Ellis. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk about the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program Portfolio. As you can see on this slide, I co-lead this program uh, together with uh, Dr. Pascal Jean and Dr. Chris Grimes, um, who recently joined NIFA and is with us today. Uh, so I'm going to take this opportunity uh, to turn it over to him and allow him to describe the GusNet portfolio. Chris. Thank, thank you, Mallory. I appreciate that. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the the GusNet uh, project is a uh, portfolio is a, a very diverse and important project that NIFA operates and has two major goals. Um, the first is to conduct and evaluate projects intended to increase the purchase or procurement of fruits and vegetables for income elig eligible consumers. So really trying to uh, get those individuals who might lack uh, in, uh, fruits and vegetables in their diet to get them to increase that in their diet. And then second is to bring together stakeholders from different parts of the food and healthcare systems to foster understanding of how they might work together to improve the health and nutrition status of particip participants in sort of a synergistic uh, pathway. Now, within the, uh, the GusNet portfolio, there are basically three legs to that stool in this competitive grant program. And the first is the Nutrition Incentive Program. And that's a collaboration uh, with the Food Nutrition Service. Uh, and it's intended to increase the purchase of fruits and vegetables by consumers with limited financial resources participating in SNAP or NAP by providing incentives at the point of purchase. Now, there are three different parts to the Nutrition Incentive Program, three different types of projects. The first are pilot projects. Now, those pilot projects can be up to $100,000 and are basically starter projects that last for one year, and they require 100% match. The second is the standard project, which goes up to $500,000. They can last up to four years. They also require 100% match. And then finally, the large-scale project, which is greater than $500,000, and they last up to four years also with 100% match. The second uh, competitive program within the GusNet portfolio is the Produce Prescription Program. And that's where we partner with healthcare, uh, uh, healthcare partners uh, who write 
prescriptions for fresh fruits and vegetables exchange for fresh fruits uh, and vegetables for our participants. The PPR project are, is intended to improve dietary health through increased consumption of fruits and vegetables, to reduce individual and household food insecurity, as well as to reduce health care usage and associated costs. Now, the uh, GusNet PPR program is a program that's less than 500, uh, less than or up to $500,000. And it's up to three years, and there's no match for that. The final leg uh, to the GusNet portfolio is Nutrition Incentive Program Training Technical Assistance Evaluation and Information Centers, or NTAE for short, these cooperative agreements. And what they do, the NTAE, provide technical assistance services as well as reporting and evaluation support to Nutrition Incentive Programs and the Produce Prescription Program to the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program as a whole. That is a $7 million project in a continuation for four years, and there's no match. There is significant alignment here amongst all these three different programs. There is significant alignment with health promotion, nutrition security, economic recovery, rural revitalization, as well as racial equity. I'll now turn it over to Mallory to look at the impacts of the program. Thank you very much. Um, I'm also going to go ahead um, and note for everyone that I added to the chat uh, NIFA's upcoming um, right funding opportunity or request for applications calendar. Um, in in this coming fiscal year, 2024, uh, both the Nutrition Incentive Program and the Produce Prescription Program uh, will will be having a competition. Um, so if you are interested in either of those two grant programs, uh, please take a look at the upcoming RFA calendar um, for when those may be published. Um, and the, the GUSNIP program and, and portfolio uh, has been um, around since 2019, just this past year, uh, the, the program published our, our third uh, impact findings report, the data from year three, which has been very exciting. Um, you'll see that uh, Sheila has added that to the chat. Um, part of what we're really excited about is that this whole community, right, the produce prescription community and the nutrition incentive community have added over 3,000 different food access locations um, across the country, right? So uh, this could be perhaps, right, a, a clinic, a healthcare clinic with a farmer's market um, where those produce prescriptions can be exchanged for fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, this can be uh, either, you know, a uh, a, a farmer's market, a, a grocery store, a convenience store um, in in communities where those those SNAP benefits or nutrition assistance program block grant benefits can be leveraged um, to to provide that fruit and vegetable incentive in the nutrition incentive program. So it's very exciting to see right the the access and affordability uh, really be improved through the the work of all of the right grantees in this program. Um, we have the opportunity um, in this program um, to collect and aggregate uh, not only information about right, the various uh, food outlets where nu you know, nutrition incentives and produce prescriptions can be redeemed, but also the, the individuals who are participating in these projects, right? Uh, what kind of changes might, might we be seeing in, in their lives? Um, and it's been wonderful to now have you know, consistent um, impact findings and, and data to show that we are seeing um, decreases in, in food insecurity um, as, as participants are with right, the Nutrition Incentive and Produce Prescription Program, as well as right, increases in fruit and vegetable consumption, right, which, which we're really hopeful for. Um, and in, in that healthcare partnership, Right, that, that Chris described, uh, we're seeing more and more of our awardees right, work very closely um, with those healthcare partners, right? Um, in some cases with the electronic um, health record or medical record to really dig into um, any changes we might be seeing when it comes to healthcare use and associated cost. Um, and it's, it's really wonderful to see that. We're seeing that when it comes to um, what we would call positive utilization, right? More and more engagement um, with well visits and, and prevention screenings. Um, and then also uh, you know, the, 
the converse, right? Um, as folks have, um, you know, greater greater control and improved um, management of the diet-related chronic diseases they may be at risk for, um, or or actively managing, right, with their healthcare partners. Um, you know, are we seeing? You know, changes hopefully decreases right when it comes to uh, emergency room visits and and things of of that nature. So, we're we're really happy to see this. We're happy to see um, you know, high satisfaction uh, with these projects that are that are out there operating, um, and also you know, because these these programs work focused on right that fresh fruit and vegetable prescription or that uh, fruit and vegetable incentive right uh, those incentive dollars uh, in the in the local communities are having um, a wonderful wonderful economic impact as you can see here right um, over over 85 million dollar right uh, uh, impact of the the, the prescriptions, right, and the fruit and vegetable um, incentives issued in those local communities. Um, so uh, I would say um, if you are, are working in this space um, or, you know, if there's other, um, you know, similar work going on around you, um, we would uh, love for you to uh, get connected with this community. I'll I'll be sure to right drop into ch the the chat um, where we have the the list of uh, awardee projects and how that um, that technical assistance right um, a, an evaluation center that Chris described right how how that creates open communities of practice right for for. Um, anyone in this space, right, community members to to engage on several topics. Uh, but of course, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate um, to reach out to a GUSNIP team member. Um, and we, we thank you all for your interest today. And I have the pleasure of turning the presentation over to uh, Dr. Vance Owens of the SARE program. Thanks, Mallory. Um, and so this, uh, the SARE program, or Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education, similar to what Sarah had mentioned earlier, is one of the one of the few programs that we've listed here that has no mention of food or anything like unto it in the title, but has done a lot of work in the local um, and regional food systems arena. I'll put a, a link in the chat as I finish. Um, I just did a quick search right before we came on the, onto the webinar. And, and found that over the last five years, the, the, there have been 273 projects funded by SARE in the four different regions that had some relevance to local and regional food systems to the tune of about $18 million. And I'll put a link in, it, in the chat that, that when, I, when I finish where you can go and see those projects or search other the, the entire database of, of SARE projects that have been funded over its 35 plus year um, history. <clears throat> so SARE, the, the, the goal as you look through this slide is, is um, very broad. Um, and if I were gonna summarize the, the, the goals that are listed there, that are listed, let, that, that, are, that are there because those are the le legislative requirements, I would say that the, that what SARE projects and the SARE program um, tries to do is address all three aspects, the three primary aspects of sustainability, and those are related to economics or economic sustainability um, or profitability, as we would often like to, to, to say within the, within the program, the environmental sustainability. Um, so we have a lot of projects that deal with all kinds of environmental issues, including climate change. The Western region, for example, just put out a, a publication just in the last week or two about the, their work on, on, on climate change over the last 10 years or so. And then finally, social sustainability, or what we will refer to it as oftentimes within the program, is the quality of life for individuals, communities, et cetera. Um, and I think if you so if you think about it from that standpoint, I think it's easier to see where the local and regional food systems fit in. But also, if you look at bullet number one, two, three, four, under the goals where it says to protect the health and safety of persons involved in the food and farm system, I think that also is probably the one of one of the more explicit 
um, uh, sub goals that 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 Sarah um, has that addresses these local and regional food systems, but all of them do to some extent or another. Similar to the rural development centers, um, SARE is a regionally administered program. So there is a host institution in each of the four regions that you see on the map that runs various grant programs. Um, most of them uh, run four to five that are common among the four the, the, among the four regions. They may have a slightly different title, but the the, the purpose is is essentially the same. And then each region might have one or two programs that they manage um, that is unique to that region. So some of the common programs would be on the research and education side. Those are the the, the largest grants down to some of the, the, the smaller ones, but the most number of grants that get that get awarded are farmer and rancher grants that are that are grants that are uh, given directly to producers to do research on their on their farm. And even within the other grant programs, especially on the research side, there's a there's a requirement that producers be involved in those in those project, um, not just as a kind of an ancillary in an ancillary way, but have uh, meaningful involvement in those projects. And so it gets down to what I would call the, 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 to, the to the grassroots level. And I think that's a, a hallmark probably of the SARE program is the, 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 the grassroots level of, of development, um, of um, decisions, of research that takes place. Um, there are so many different types of projects that are funded um, within SARE um, across the food systems um, and across those three areas of sustainability. Um, there is very broad eligibility for the various grant programs. And so I would encourage you, if you're interested in, in, in applying for any grant from the SARE program, is go to the, the website that's listed at the bottom, SARE.org. And from that national website, you can go to each of the regional websites um, and find who the grant managers are um, for the various, well, first you can find what the various uh, uh, grant programs are in the region, and you can get the contact information for uh, the grant managers for those programs in each region. You are also more than welcome to reach out to me if, if that, if you can't find that, and I can, I can guide you into areas that, that might be of, of greatest help. Um, it's hard to, the, I can't say when the dates are for each of those that when each of those grant programs are are are, are due because they vary by region and by grant program. But um, please go to the website and you can find that info that information out um, pretty easily. I will also point out that I, I mentioned the four regional host institutions, but at the bottom of the slide, you see that we also have what's called the National Reporting Coordination and Communications Office. And if you're looking for it, really. Each, each region has their own outreach materials, but from a national perspective, um, there are a lot of outreach materials that are um, from, from videos to publications of, of various sorts um, that are freely available on the, 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 the SARE um, outreach website um, that, that, that cover a, a myriad of topics, um, including local and regional foods. And so I would encourage you to look there if you have any questions. Um, about this uh, program as well. I think that's it. I'll, I'll put in the chat here um, uh, a really good resource where you can go and, and, and look and see what types of projects have been funded by SARE. Um, that's the database. Uh, there is one classification specifically called Sustainable Communities, Local and Regional Food Systems. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jody Williams, where I think Sheila is going to take her place. Thank you, Dr. Owens. Dr. Owens is a great example of, I think, the really interdisciplinary work we're doing at NIFA here. And again, as Tim and Sarah both said, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that their program doesn't have central food and nutrition security, but really they can see their reach as having an impact. And so very much appreciate their teamwork um, and thinking bigger and bolder about our integrative approaches um, to tackling food and nutrition and security. I am not Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams is on travel today, but I did want to elevate um, two key programs to local and regional food systems that she leads. And I really do want to emphasize Dr. Williams' longtime leadership on both of these programs, and she's an amazing contact. So if you have any questions, if you think your program fits in this area or not, 
feel free to reach out to her. She's a tremendous resource. And uh, hopefully, um, as you're seeing, as I put all the bio information into the chat, um, one nice thing about USDA is we are one USDA. And so all of our emails are our name, give or take if we have common names. Um, but generally, it's jody.williams.usda.gov. So again, I have her contact information there, but feel free um, to use that dichotomy to, to email any of the program leads that you see today. And again, as you see their um, staff links that will hopefully direct you to their emails as well. But talking about food safety outreach program, do want to lift up this incredible relationship we've had with the FDA to really help some smaller size um, operations around food safety and the Food Safety Modernization Act. And this has been a tremendous um, resource for folks as they um, get in compliance with our food safety modernization um, laws. And you can see that there's various types of projects that are supported here. And again, with the key being um, outreach and collaboration. So again, sometimes it's participating in some of the trainings that might be a resource for you or some of your businesses that you're working with. So please feel free to reach out to Jody if you have any questions about the food safety outreach program. I also want to lift up another program led by Dr. Williams, which is the Small Business Innovation Research, or SBIR. This is, again, run out of Department of Commerce, and um, USDA has various leads as it relates to priority areas, and Jody helps on our nutrition and food safety areas, and again, is a tremendous resource if you aren't sure if you qualify or if the work that you want to do fits into the phases, um, just reach out to her. I think that's the best way to say it, is you never know till you know. Um, this walks through kind of our purpose um, of having this program, but really, again, it's to, to really help small businesses um, innovate in this space, and particularly around local and regional food systems, you could think of an array of areas where we could support innovation in this space. Now I have the pleasure, and I think she might have peeked in when I was introducing, we had a, a little bit of a jumble of bringing in our two new um, national program leaders today. Um, one you met earlier that Dr. Cohen's introduced on Gust of Dr. Grimes. And then also I'm gonna present um, our new program lead. She just started um, on this program last week. So I'm gonna let her introduce herself, um, really spend the time to just introduce herself and really the work that she's gonna be working on in the food safety work. And as it relates today to the um, equipment grants program. Hello. Thank you, Sheila. Hi, my name is Junia Bulbron, and I am the new national program leader, as mentioned um, by Sheila. I recently joined um, NIFA, and, um, and I'm currently working on a, several projects, and one of them is um, the antimicrobial resistance pro um, program that we have for mitigation of antimicrobial um, pathogens. And with that program, again, it's food safety related. Um, it's not, it was earlier in the, one of the earlier slides, but it's not part of what I'm gonna talk about right now, but it is again, one of those programs, again, to improve our food safety in collaboration with a lot of the research um, facilities. But today um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the equipment grant program, which is really um, an opportunity that offers for uh, the ability to, um, acquire a large piece of equipment that typically um, may, may not be covered in some, one of the grants that you may have applied for to NIFA, for example. So this grant allows you to be able to acquire that piece of equipment um, for you to be able to um, continue some of the extension work that you might be doing. So the purpose of the grant is to seek and to strengthen the quality um, and expand the scope of fundamental applied research for colleges and universities and um, state cooperative institutions. It also funds the acquisition of a shared use um, special purpose equipment instrument for fundamental and applied research for the use of food and agricultural sciences program, including data sciences and um, data systems. Um, but with that grant, you are um, not able to basically suit up your lab, um, you know, getting all new equipment to, to start a brand new lab and um, get all the equipment that you have. As I mentioned earlier, it's mainly to provide assistance to strengthen what you already have. If you already have some projects that already started, but you need a large piece of equipment to supplement what you're already doing to um, be able to um, continue the research and, you, you know, be more um efficient, you'll be able to add that piece of equipment to apply into that grant. So there's no matching for a requirement for this grant. Um, for this year, it's already closed, but usually the range for this grant is between 25,000 to 500,000. So you really could acquire um, a large piece of equipment with that. Um, and most of the topics that are covered with that grant include um, things like natural resources, um, food and nutrient sec security, 
human science, plant, animal, food science, farming, environmental, and advanced technology. So it covers a, a wide range of um, areas that you could actually apply for that grant to get equipment to support your research. Um, and with that, some of the priorities that's covered is obviously um, advancing um, racial justice, equity, and opportunity, and creating more and better marketing opportunity for um, the local food system in tackling um, food nutrition and insecurity. And as I um, mentioned earlier in the earlier statement, it's for a lot of colleges, universities, and cooperative institutions. So higher learning, Hispanic serving institutions, in insular areas in cooperative extensions are all welcome to apply for this grant. And the links are provided below um, for if you have any question, there's more detail on our website that can provide you exactly how you will be able to go through the process and apply for this grant. And if you have any question or information have been provided, please feel free to reach out to us and ask us more questions. And I'll pass it on to Sheila. Thank you. That was a wonderful overview on a, like an hour's notice where we were going to introduce our new national program leaders today. So welcome to the NIFA family. And again, thank you for making time to give the presentation on equipment grants. It's an often overlooked resource, particularly the local regional food system could be a fruitful um, program to look at. Um, really, hopefully you got a theme from all of us today that we are on a mission um, to advance food and nutrition security, but really all of the secretary's priorities, um, which include climate, new and better markets, um, workforce development and promoting youth voice, please um, reach out if you have any questions about our programs or our approaches. Again, I noticed we were just highlighting a handful of our local and regional food system programs today across our AFRI and non-AFRI um, programs. So if there's one that we missed today that you're really interested in, feel free to ask a question today. Otherwise, feel free to email me and I'll make sure you get connected with the relevant program officer. At this point, I wanna ask all of our panelists um, to come on camera and we're gonna to transition to gallery view and answer, I think there's a handful of questions already in the Q&A, and then I have a couple I wanna queue up our team to discuss. So again, getting started today, I really do wanna emphasize, there's a lot of programs at NIFA, over 70, and really over, I didn't do the hard count, but I think over, over 20 that are in the local and regional food system space. And so I really, for our panelists um, today, I want them to each give their individual perspective of when a potential grantee or an existing grantee who's kind of thinking through kind of new or more money, how they walk them through the various programs that are available. I'm gonna have Dr. Melnick, our division director for global climate change start off, and then we'll just go around for the various panels, panelists to kind of give their input of advice they give uh, grantees or potential grant uh, applicants, um, how they would navigate NIFA. Rachel? I always like to start letting everyone know, emailing national program leaders who programs that you are interested in to set up a time to chat with them. I think we're a very open agency. We really like to connect with people. And if that's not the right person, that's not the right program, they don't think they will connect you to the right person. So if there's a program that you're interested in, please feel free to contact either the program staff listed or some of them have a specific email box for that program and they will go ahead and set up a time to chat with you. That's always a great way to connect to our programs and they might have ideas for other programs that might be relevant for you as well. Thank you, Rachel. I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Roker, if you have any advice. Thanks. Um, I was going to plus one uh, Rachel's comment. As an NPL, as a national program leader, it is absolutely our job to help um, answer questions and sort of play operator, if you will. If we don't feel that our program um, is the right fit, then that's we do our due diligence to talk not only across our divisions, but across our institutes. Um, in the manner in which you saw the diversity of the programs today, uh, we really aim to make sure that you are served when you reach out to us. So again, an email, a Teams visit, um, and all of our program sites have our names on them. And sometimes there are one or two of us per program. So if you don't get one, you'll definitely get uh, the other. And again, we really do welcome that uh, stakeholder feedback and that reach out. Thank you, Dr. Roker. And I was going to have John Elise speak from a program specialist perspective. Often you're the front lines of those program emails. So do you want to talk a little bit about how you help folks navigate things when they email you or contact? Thank you, Sheila. Um, 
Yes, I would like to add that when I receive notifications or questions from stakeholders, um, I reach out uh, for the national program leader and also for the webpage of the, um, of the program. Uh, sometimes it gives information, extra information, in addition, in addition to the RFA, and it includes also um, Q and A's or uh, frequently asked questions, or it will give you an idea of what was the purpose of the program and if it fits to you. So you will, you can reach out to us and we can redirect you if it's needed, as needed to the national program leader or the program that it fits better for you. Thank you. And I do see, I'm gonna be um, using the Q&A function to, to go through questions. I do see some questions coming into the chat. Please do use the Zoom q and will help me make sure they get answered. And it gives all of our panelists a nice organized way to kind of look at your questions and think about them before answering. Um, I do wanna indicate somebody was asking a question, um, really I think kind of leaning towards our USDA supported farm to school programs. Um, I do wanna kind of just bring that in as generally often, um, with our community food project and then our USDA um, food and nutrition service line, food farm to school programs and some of their other supports for community food systems. Often there's a lot of intersections across those two mission areas and grant programs. And so exactly what um, Mallory emailed in the chat and then also what John Lee said, you know, often we're helping you navigate or braid funding as possible and just kind of figuring out from an eligibility standpoint or just kind of what you're looking to fund. Um, where we're going to be best fitted in the short and long term. I do want to transition to see if Dr. Truddle has input she wants to share here on just how she helps um, particularly economists or social scientists maybe navigate the various funding opportunities we have for them. Sure. Well, AERC like this has held a webinar, um, technical assistance webinar, where we've invited um, folks from different economics programs to attend. I also, um, the Ag Econ Conference every summer, AAEA, um, I held a PD meeting there and then um, met with a number of different economists who were just interested in um, how to get funded, what the process is, and um, probably a few times a week, I will meet with people that just reach out to me and say, I have this idea, here are three paragraphs, does it fit in with your program? And then I, you know, we meet and I chat and I give them kind of the standard advice that I always give, which is make sure it's well written, make sure you define your terms. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you, Dr. Chad. I particularly appreciate you emphasizing the role of national conferences as many of us are kind of getting back on the street, so to speak, in person. I think that's such an invaluable opportunity to meet with our NIFA staff. We're generally um, really encouraged to travel and get to our key professional meetings or just kind of key special events in our space. So if you see one of us, or as you're kind of going through program pages, look at the contacts, see what they look like, and try to find us. I think we're generally gonna be approachable at conferences or presenting program overviews, and just try to you know go up after and, and really meet them. I think that one-on-one -on -one time of kind of figuring out your program as it relates to our program is such an important time for you. I'm just using the American Society for Nutrition that was held this summer as an example. I think I have over 80 individual sessions just following up from that meeting. So again, we really do try to make time. I do wanna qualify as you're emailing people as we were kind of averting a government shutdown. Sometimes it's not the day you email that our government staff is able to respond to you or running program, getting money out the door. So just be patient. Sometimes I'll get folks um, responding to be like, oh, I emailed them, but they haven't responded back. I'm like, can you give them a week? Maybe they're in panel this week or whatever it might be. So just be graceful. Um, with reaching out, but generally I find all of our staff is very responsive. So if you don't hear from them in the week, you know, just kind of pop an email. Usually our staff is really good about giving you an out of office notice, kind of giving you a grace of like when they might be out for panel. So just know if they're out for panel, then it might be like a catch up time after. So just give them a little grace with that, but just do know our staff is really responsive and just try your best if needed or urgent to call or, or redirect to another program staff. I wanna um, chime in and have Dr. Cohen's weigh in on this. She's done this a ton of times with Gus Nip and the other AFRI programs that she leads as well. I'm sorry, Sheila, what's the specific question? Navigating NIFA. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think that not being hesitant to start 
right? Starting somewhere, even if your first email comes to me, right? And it says like, oh, you know, I heard you talk and I'm looking to do uh, a farm to school thing. You know, then I can say, okay, you know, here's what I know of in the NIFA family and what I might know of in the federal family, right? Whether it's um, a complimentary program operated by the Food Nutrition Service, right? Or if it's a program run by one of my colleagues, right? Like the Food Ag Service Learning Program. Um, we, we are here for that. Um, I will say if you're, it's always great to start early, right? If you're in the earliest phases, if you think you've got maybe some, some pilot money um, and you have a longer term vision, um, that you know maybe long term you know you you'd like to go for a a produce prescription um project or a uh, you know a, a gusnip nutrition incentive project and you're you're in the early stages working on matching right it's always good to have those long term um conversations with a national program leader uh, that can you know help you think about the competitive portfolio perhaps in a different light um and AFRI um, is a really wonderful example of that, right? Where there, there, there's growth in how AFRI is designed at the highest levels, right? There's opportunities when it comes to research and, and education, right? For in undergraduate settings, there's opportunities for pre-doctoral and post-doctoral fellows, right? There's seed funding, right, um, to really increase initial, you know, investigator capacity, and then go for standard grants. And then there's cooperative, right, there are those CAP awards, right, those coordinated agricultural project awards and sustainable ag systems. So sometimes it can be really beneficial, right, to have that initial, you know, 15 minute conversation with a national program leader. If you've got a long term vision, you maybe want to carry out and know if NIFA could be right, a, a home for some of the work you're thinking about. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. She's been a tremendous leader on Gus NIF and also our AFRI, I call it our prevention priority area, but has also had a lot of experience on a variety of other programs, including the equipment grants program that our new MPL has. She just started a couple of weeks ago, but I wanted to make sure if she has um, any thoughts for navigating NIFA um, that she has a chance to weigh in. Dr. G? Okay. Oh, hi. <laughs> I was on mute. Uh, actually, um, I'm going through the process right now with the uh, proposals. And one of the things that I would suggest that people um, do, especially if you, after you reach out to national program leaders, I think that's very important for you to um, reach out to them if you have any questions, if you have any interest, they might be able to guide you to the right path as to um, you know, what you need to do. And we do provide information even to the application process. So if you have some question there, it's really good to reach out to you and to us and we can you know, provide you with the link of you know, the application process itself. But one of the things that I learned um, going through this process is after you actually took the time to re re write out your proposal, please submit it on time because you don't want to miss the whole process because it came in after the deadline. So I would say, you know, after you reach out to someone, you get all the information that you need and you know what you're supposed to do, just try to make sure it gets in on time so that way it could actually get reviewed and um, be part of the process so you don't miss out on the opportunity to get the grant. So that would be my suggestion. Very important lesson learned. And as many folks I think are transitioning institutions or on your career path, or if you're transitioning different roles or different departments, it's so important to work with your um, institutional research support staff and just know your endpoint of like when you think you need to submit um, versus when the university thinks you need to submit. I think I've seen that so many times with some more early stage folks or people who are transitioning institutions that they just kind of misjudge how much time they think they actually have and the application is due. Um, it's due to us, but through your university, it might be an earlier time point to make all these um, institutional pieces come together. So please don't underestimate that submission process and really do work with your institutional support and try your best to kind of understand those types of processes. And we can help with that too. So always feel free if you have questions or how best to navigate it. Often we know folks who are at your university who might be your secret sauce of navigating that process. I want to transition to our other new MPL and see if Dr. Um, Grimes has any suggestions on navigating NIFA, as particularly he's navigating uh, NIFA in his new role. Yeah, th thank you, Sheila. Yeah, I'll just bring up to I, I echo what everybody else has said, and and I can say, being new, uh, that the uh, 
the in a, the MPLs are exceptionally helpful and very knowledgeable about the different areas and uh, will uh, be able to help you in, in any fashion that they can. Uh, two things, as being in, uh, a new MPL, I remember very clearly what it was like developing these grants and developing these applications. And uh, for those of you who have creative and what I would say who like to think out of the box and things like that, you might be wondering, well, does does NIFA have a program that will fit this idea or does my idea fit this program in NIFA? NIFA has so many, uh, it has such a broad portfolio of funding opportunities. Um, it is very, like, very likely that as you get your objectives and goals down, that there is a place for you. And so be creative, be uh, think outside the box and uh, look for those opportunities. And the second one uh, is, uh, is, is a, a little bit just more practical. Uh, be very, uh, be well versed in the RFA. Uh, make sure that you have all your T's crossed, all your I's dotted. Make sure, similar to making sure that you turn in your application on time, uh, there, there's, um, there are many things in those RFAs that, that, uh, that need to happen in order for a successful application to go through. And those are not just random things. They're there for a reason and they're important. So make sure you're very well versed. And if you have a question about it or a concern, reach out to one of the MPLs and we'll explain the process and uh, and help you out through that. And Mallory knows I'm always good for the plug and I, I apologize they don't have the slide handy, but volunteer. We have a variety of panels and I think that's the best way to learn our programs and where your potential ideas fit is serving as a reviewer. All of our national program leaders can help and we'll make sure it gets in the chat of how to volunteer to be a reviewer. But that I think is an excellent way to kind of get a sense of how NIFA funds things, how our panel process is a significant um, component to getting a competitive award. Um, so I do want to just encourage that as part of the process. I think then you'll see as Dr. Grimes is lifting up like how important that RFA is and where people are kind of evaluating you um, in relationship to what the call for proposals is. I want to uh, end this particular uh, big picture cop topic question of navigating NIFA with last but not least, Dr. Owens, who can kind of suggest some feedback from his perspective. Sure, I agree with everything. I, I think the only thing that I didn't hear that I would suggest that, that, that would be an addition would be to look at what has been funded in the past. I mean, because the, the NPLs can, you know, can give direction on what might be acceptable into a program, and we're all very willing to do that. Um, but look at what's been funded so that you can see what kinds of projects the the the, the reviewers have have actually liked. And and NPLs can give you a, a link, especially for some of the, the main NIFA programs, to our Chris website that, frankly, is not that friendly, the Chris website <laughs> itself. But if you have a link from an NPL that goes just to the projects that are associated with that program, at least it can kind of winnow down, you know, to the to the projects that are most applicable. And so that's the only thing I would add is to look at what's been funded. That's an excellent one, Dr. Owens. I was thinking about that when we were chatting as well. I think to me, that is one of the biggest things I have learned in the academic process is to kind of seek mentors or seek colleagues who are kind of in similar space. I know often sometimes folks think people are competitive, but often it's a great way to collaborate. Um, it might end up being teamwork makes their dream work and you become collaborators and send it together. Or at least if, again, if somebody's more mid-level or senior to you, you could at least kind of get a sense of their career path, how they've used pre- or post-docs and kind of use that um, to launch their funding cycle with NIFA. So I definitely agree. Sometimes Chris just needs a little bit of help to navigate, but we could help you walk through that too. It's a good way to kind of see who's being funded in your space. And then just don't be shy to reach out to them. I think sometimes the message is to reach out to your MPL and you, you hear that, hopefully you take that um, to heart. But also I, just don't be shy to reach out to researchers in your space that might be helpful of teaching you how to kind of navigate NIFA or other funding sources that you might be interested. I think that's so important to the mentorship process and also hopefully you pay it forward too, right? As you reach out to others, hopefully as others reach out to you, you do the same. I do wanna transition now at this point um, to another question before we kind of go to the Zoom Q&A questions that are coming through. And one is, we talked about navigating NIFA, right? Or over 70 programs or more than 20 that are related to local regional food system. I wanted to call Dr. Roker because she's been tapped um, to serve on our USDA local or regional, regional, regional food system management team and to talk a little bit about how NIFA coordinates across our department. As many of us mentioned, there's food and nutrition service, farm to school program. There's a variety of other programs in our agricultural marketing service program 
that are related. And so often we're not just navigating NIFA when we chat with you, but we're navig navigating all of USDA, all of our federal sources. And sometimes we even know of non-government sources that might be relevant to help you out. So Dr. Roker, I'm gonna have you walk through kind of our efforts to, to coordinate in this space. Thanks, Sheila. Do we get to have slides for this or would you like me to do this? Great, thanks. So as Sheila mentioned, uh, NIFA is um, not alone in being an agency that sees the value of uplifting the topic of local and regional food systems as a through line and a thread to link our programs and talk about and promote our programming that we do. We also participate at a department level in coordination in multiple groups um, around the topic of local regional food systems. And this effort really has been go ongoing for uh, decades, but really reinvigorated about two years ago in a new interagency structure with a mission sort of internally here to sort of strengthen um, our USDA, sort of one USDA programming around local and regional food systems by having employees from different agencies talk to each other on a regular basis get education and keep each other apprised of our programs related to LRFS. And the vision that we have around the working group, this sort of internal working group, is that by being better coordinated and communicative across agencies in one USDA, that we're contributing to a US food system with greater thriving local and regional food systems, stronger economies, financial security, healthy environment, and so on. And you can see the vision statement there of, of what we think we're contributing to. The next slide is just a visualization sort of internally of how some of this coordination looks. And again, this is coordination that happens at sort of an internal management team, those sort of blue boxes being the acronyms for the various USDA agencies that have representation and meet on a regular basis to talk about our programs. And then there's a broader working group that has over, I think it's at this point, maybe 300, if I'm not mistaken, uh, members that come to get education on monthly webinars. And then within that working group, there are various subcommittees. Again, this is mostly just agency level folks who just like the folks you've heard from today, who manage programs, who have this unique opportunity to talk across our or across sort of the nuanced topics um, and figure out how we can advance, you know, sort of more systematically uh, these goals, right? These broader strategic goals through local and regional food systems programming. I'm happy to say that NIFA has um, participation at every level here in this diagram, at the management level, at the working group and at the subcommittee level. And that's something that I think has really strengthened even our own impetus to have a webinar like this today and to have our own dedicated um, website coming out for articulating local and regional food systems. We think that many of other agencies are also following that path. And again, I want to especially thank our colleagues at Ag Marketing Service, who are the ones that have been coordinating all of us. Um, and yeah, there's uh, too many people to name in that group. But the next slide and my final slide on this topic is to say to you all in the audience today, if you are internal to USDA, there are ways that you can get involved in this coordination. And here are two sort of levels of um, listserv that you can join to be in, in the action. If you are external to USDA, I'm gonna drop a link right here in the chat, which is to get on the local regional food systems newsletter that AMS puts out. And again, they are sort of the coordinator of coordinators right now. If you're not already on that, that's an excellent place to keep abreast of what we're talking about interagency. And again, just want to um, let you all know that we expect this topic to only further grow. So keep looking out for the newsletter to really exemplify where we are seeing new websites like the NIFA website to come more webinars on this topic and more opportunities for stakeholder feedback. With that, I'll turn it back to Sheila and thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Roker, for all your coordination efforts across USDA. And many of our other panelists also coordinate through a variety of other relevant entities. Rachel, do you wanna talk a little bit about the work you do on the US Global Change Research Program? Yes, the US Global Change Research Program, we're thinking about the acronym, is an interagency effort that coordinates climate efforts across federal agencies. So it is both extramural, the granting agencies, as well as intramural researchers to coordinate around a range of topics addressing climate change and climate science. So I will drop I will drop the USGCRP 
um, web page into the chat so everyone can go ahead and see it, but they also re put out an annual report to Congress, which is a really great way to see all the different efforts. And it's quite broad and there's a lot of efforts on outreach and very focused on food as well. Thank you, Dr. Melanis. We greatly appreciate your overview of that program and also your leadership on it. I've had the opportunity to work with many of our colleagues in developing a climate change food system and nutrition security work stream as part of that group. We brought to the table, I think more than 50 who weren't necessarily traditional climate people, often more people like me in the nutrition and food system space. We very much have welcomed how welcoming that program is to kind of thinking through things with multiple disciplinary perspective. I also want to highlight for Dr. Cohen, she's been a big push of like us thinking through our coordination across HHS and also the Veterans Affairs um, around produce prescription programs. And so we're working with um, both of those departments on better coordinating broadly um, in the food as medicine space, and then particularly around the data around healthcare utilization and a variety of other relevant data endpoints. So we're really excited about the work that we're doing within MIFA um, to coordinate around local and regional food systems across USDA and really across the federal family. And as many of these programs highlight with our partners at land grant universities, really just a broad swap of people that we work through um, through our funding um, reach. So just want to encourage um, if you have any questions on these topics or um, just interested how we coordinate or connect across um, federal entities, feel free to reach out. We're happy, happy to answer those questions. I do want to finally go to answering um, our Zoom Q&A questions. Some of them I answered along the way, but do want to just encourage um, you to, to answer, uh, put in any questions that you haven't put in there. I know some of us are, are some of us are, some of our panels are already answering them, um, but do want to kind of have those questions lifted up for the broader audience. We do record these webinars, and as I lifted up a number of times, we go through ADA compliance for our webinars and our slides, and once all that's ready, if you're registered, you get a, a tick, right? <laughs> this is ready. And then we also put it on our webinar site. And then particularly with this webinar, we're trying to launch our topic page at the same time. So you probably see through our social media channels us promoting the, the webinar, but also the topic page. So feel free if you don't see it in the next week or two to just ding me. If you're dying to get the information the next day or two, I can kind of give you a preview um, as long as you don't publicly um, share it. Um, but just want to let you know, we do record on um, the webinars and do um, share those out. Um, folks have also asked about kind of getting uh, credit um, for attending today's webinar. Dr. Cohen was really big about us pushing for continuing learning through the, um, the Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics. We have submitted for a handful of our webinars, um, and we can do that for this one as well. It does take a couple months, um, but I would just say keep your registration handy if you're going to submit to any of your um, continuing learning efforts. And if you need anything more formal in the interim, feel free to reach out to me. We're happy to um, certify your participation um, if you were here and we have, have record of that. I also want to um, direct a question to Jen Lee around the community foods pro um, project. Um, there was a question about if the training and technical assistance continuation award was only available to those who had been awarded a planning grant. So Yamalise, you want to talk about that? Jamalise. Yes, thank you. I already answered it, but um, to add to that, Yes, when it's a continuation um, a project, then it will have it will it will receive the funding through the uh, duration of the project. So if the project is four years, then that's the 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 continuation will go through all the four years. And at, at the end of those four years, then that with the application, the request for application will open again, and it will be uh, either adjusted or continue with four year program plans. Thank you. And then Mallory, I've seen you answer this question um, directly, but for the sake of everyone, I want to kind of lift it up. Um, a participant asked, is there a way to search for access points contacts by state? Um, and this was in the context that came during GUSNIP. And it said, oftentimes federal program contacts are nested in different state agencies. So it's not clear how these federal programs track into states. Um, I'm in Georgia. In the case, there are only specific states that have such program asset maps that I can be pointed to on the federal end. And Mallory, you, you answer this, but could you share for the benefit of everyone? Yeah, so for yeah, for just a informational, right, about the, the GusNet portfolio in general, um, as as Chris, um, you know, really described for all of us, the, the technical assistance, right, um, and then evaluation information center, uh, 
part of the services, right, and supports that they provide to, right, the nutrition incentive and, and produce prescription uh, programs is also a map, and the link is, is in the Q&A for folks who are interested, of GUSNIP awardees. Now, NIFA, on the NIFA GUSNIP page, has a list of all of those funded projects. It's the same information. Um, it's presented in a different way, right? It, it is a map. So in this case, right, if you are in Georgia and you want to know what other nutrition incentive and produce prescription work funded through the GUSNIP portfolio is going on in Georgia, you can click on Georgia and you can find those lists of nutrition incentive and produce prescription projects. Um, and it also right, can link you out to those organizations and where they're active. Um, in, in the nutrition incentive space, right, which is leveraging those food assistance programs operated by the Food Nutrition Service, right, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program in the 50 states, as well as Guam and the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as the Nutrition Assistance Program block grants in Puerto Rico, American Samoa, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands. Uh, FNS maintains a list of not only, right, their broad list of all you know, SNAP authorized retailers, but then a subset list um, for those SNAP authorized retailers that are participating in a nutrition incentive project, right? So that you could, you can even know, um, and, and this is uh, also an available resource uh, that the um, Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion has, right? For Start Simple with My Plate. And um, you can see not only, right, where these food assistance dollars can be redeemed, but also if that location is participating in a fruit and vegetable um, incentive project um, that's tagged under awards. If you're using that um, app or that um, mobile website uh, that CNPP uh, releases concurrent with MyPlate. So there are additional resources to know if incentive, right, fruit and vegetable incentives are being issued. Um, so just wanting to highlight uh, some of those opportunities um, that are available in this particular portfolio. Thank you. And again, I really do encourage you to contact your program officer. Sometimes if you're just trying to figure out who's in your space and your area, who's funded or who's in this area, often they're really well connected with what's going on. And as um, Dr. Koenig and Dr. Um, Morris, who participate in that uh, research group that uh, Dr. Roker brought up, um, very much we have a pulse on a variety of data sources related to local and regional food systems. So do you want to just encourage you, if you're looking for data or just looking for kind of program contacts, sometimes our program leaders will help or be one or two directions away from somebody who could help you. I want to wrap up um, today with kind of a key last question um, for all of our panelists today as we transition, thankfully, um, to a new uh, smooth fiscal, new fiscal year, fiscal year 2024 for us in the government. Our fiscal year, as you might have seen, um, in the news starts October 1st. And so I wanted to have, um, as we wrap up our Q&A, each of the panelists talk through something they're excited about in fiscal year 2024, and that includes um, conferences that they might attend. I'll get started and say, generally, I attend the Society for Nutrition Education and Behavior. Um, that meeting this year is going to be hosted in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, last year, it was hosted in Washington, D.C., and we ended up hosting a USDA open house here with over 200 um, SNAP, it's called SNAP, um, uh, SNAP, I'm trying to say the act, Society for Nutrition Education Behavior attendees came to USDA. And so those are fun things that we try to do in RAP conferences. We try to have sessions or meet and greets that we can meet you. So I'm going to highlight that conference as one um, I'll be attending. And for this fiscal year, I'm just really excited about putting up this new topic page. We'll be putting up a tribal food sovereignty topic page soon as we have that webinar this fall. And we'll be doing a lot of work as Mallory lifted up my plate. We'll be doing a lot of work with our colleagues at the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion to make my plate the federal symbol for healthy eating a household name. So those are things I'm looking forward to um, this fiscal year. And I'll pass it off to my grad school roommate, Dr. Melnick, to share what she's excited about this fiscal year. I'm really excited. Honestly, we, we're, we hired two climate change fellows in my division to work both on environmental justice and climate adaptation. So we're really excited to have one on board and one on boarding in the next two weeks. Um, in terms of upcoming events, I'm actually really excited for the 10 year anniversary of the USDA climate hubs because I think we're going to have a joint meeting with our um, A1721, the AFRI Climate Extension Program, along with that to be like a really great big event and looking at potentially opening that up to a wider audience. So that's one thing I'm really excited about. 
I typically attend, I'll probably attend the American Geophysical Union meeting, which is very climate science focused. Um, also a, a bit of a different meeting I attend is the Sustainable Agriculture Summit. This is also in December. So looking forward to those. Exciting. And if you're going to a meeting not mentioned today, feel free to let us know because maybe one of our almost 400 colleagues are attending that meeting. I'm going to go to Dr. Truddle. What are some things you're excited about fiscal year 2024, including you mentioned uh, one conference you attend, but if any others you want to lift up? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm always excited for the Ag Econ Conference because it does introduce me to um, what researchers are thinking about now related to ag policy. And it it ranges, you know, from production all the way to food stamps and nutrition and WIC. And um, I, I always really look forward to that conference. That's exciting. Dr. Roker, you want to share anything you're excited about this fiscal year conferences you'll be attending? Yeah, um, I think I dropped a few in the chat, actually, as a response to uh, one of the audience um, questions about policy related. I'm a rural sociologist by training, so some of these conferences have been on my radar for years in that field. Um, so that's the Ag Food and Human Values, the Ag Marketing Summit. Also, Rural Sociological Society um, is yet another one. And um, yeah, those are just a few that are on my radar and looking forward to more, uh, yeah, more great work coming out of this field. Thank you. And yeah, Melise, do you want to share something you're excited about for this fiscal year? Thank you. I'm always uh, excited to go to the project directors meeting and, and conferences. I do like to see what is the work that we're funding and all the help the community is receiving. I, I'm very excited to those. And also excited to see, um, to go to the SNV, which is, you mentioned already. I always look for new things that are coming up and how can we use it that is in, a, in our programs. And the Community Foods Project had a wonderful session at SNV this year. And again, our program director meetings are geared towards folks who are funded but it's a way for us to kind of bring together folks who are in a common funding area. So things to look forward to if you secure funding from us. And Dr. Owens, what are you excited about for FY24? I'm just excited that we're open for business and uh, that's actually pretty exciting in and of itself. And I was gonna say what Jamila uh, said as well. And I, and I think mainly because, you know, this year we did a lot of uh, virtual PD meetings and I, well, or in the last fiscal year and this coming fiscal year, I think we're being encouraged to do some in-person uh, virtual uh, PD meetings, and I, um, I'm excited to to see the people and the interaction that takes place at those. That um, anyway, because they're oftentimes they are in association with a with a, a conference, and and so it 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 helps to build the, the the network among those who are already funded with those who may be looking. So that's what I'm looking forward to. And I will say, even if you're not a program director, there is benefits when they do team up with conferences. So using the Society for Nutrition Education and Behavior as an example, this past summer, we hosted the AFRI Prevention Priority Area um, program director meeting there. And so you get the benefit when you're at that conference of all these program directors coming to the meeting. It's to me, it's been a value add for SNEB that NIF has done that. And I know our, some of our food safety colleagues have done it with the Institute for Food Technology. So often we kind of transition different conferences across our programs, but just know sometimes you get the added value of the program directors all kind of consolidating at a particular conference in your area. Dr. Cohings, do you have anything super exciting for FY24? <laughs> so I completely agree with Jamilis. Um, I'm so excited that um, our community nutrition PD meeting is returning to in, in person um, this year. Uh, there's lots of exciting work going on in FY24. Um, I will say on the whole, uh, for me personally, I'm just returning from parental leave. So I too um, am going from a, a virtual attendance to now right, being back at these conferences um, in person. And that is personally right, very exciting for me. Um, I will say big things um, to watch that I'm really thrilled to be part of. Um, of course, you know, the part of the federal space looking at food is medicine, um, but also right, the greater federal space when we're thinking of nutrition incentives, right? The gusnet fruit and vegetable incentives is, is part of that. There are other uh, programs right in that overall ecosystem that we're part of. And it is just fabulous kind of looking into 
all of the ways, right, that we're able to connect with one another um, and leverage the amazing work we're doing together. Uh, and especially for me, uh, as you've heard, I, I like the data. So I have the opportunity to serve on some of these, these uh, subgroups that are interested, right, in how we're continuing to share, right, all of our impact findings um, you know, with, with one another and, of course, with the public. Thank you, Mallory. And I want to leave as we wrap up today the final notes to our two, uh, two new MPLs um, to share with them, share with us things that are excited about this new fiscal year. Um, Chris, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll echo uh, echo uh, Jamila's. Uh, I'm real excited about the PD meeting because I get to meet all these PDs that um, have submitted all these great projects and get to look at all the data. Um, looking forward to SNEB. Haven't been in a little while, and so um, it'll be nice to be back to that. I'm also uh, looking forward to uh, uh, to uh, reading about all these great research projects. Um, that uh, that our audience is sending in, and uh, I'm a lifelong learner, and so as I'm able to read these projects and and see all the great things that are being done, um, it just it it edifies me and it makes me excited about the future. I think we're in really good hands when it comes to uh, nutrition nutrition and food security, and uh, and overall health. And our new our newest MPL will give you the last word. <laughs> well, yes, so I'm really excited about the science going on in food safety. Um, even after joining NIFA, I think looking at um, food safety, not from just a researcher's perspective, but bringing it in from the agricultural um, perspective, the environmental, and connecting everything together. So looking at some of the research that we submitted, I'm very excited about the science and the direction that food safety is going in general. So it will be really interesting to see um, what goes on this year in the international food um, protection. Um, meeting, um, if I get to attend that as well, just to see the direction that the science is going for food safety. So I'm really excited about the science. Well, we're really excited about our new additions to our team, and we're really excited about all the work that we get to do with our external partners. So feel free, um, if you haven't heard that, take the take-home message from today is to please reach out. Um, hopefully we can help you navigate NIFA, whether it's looking for funding, looking for impacts in this space, or just looking how um, you can navigate in the local and regional food system area. We're very excited um, to help you, and we hope um, you have a happy fiscal year as well. So I do want to um, thank everybody, and just please feel free to reach out to me if you have any remaining questions, and we hope to see you at future editions, if not some of these conferences mentioned today. Thank you.